Hello friends, this is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about my ideal, no, not my ideal, the ideal for the whole universe cycle of Rachmaninoff piano concertos. And because there's only four of them, I tossed in the Paganini Rhapsody for good measure. And I've already done a talk on the Paganini Rhapsody. And so one of the things I'm going to do is not take any performances from my favorite cycle of Rachmaninoff piano concertos. That's Zoltan Kochius with Ada DeVard and the San Francisco Symphony on Phillips. I think that is an amazing Rachmaninoff concerto cycle. It doesn't have a weak link anywhere. It's fabulously wonderful. And none of those performances will feature here because the point I want to make is that there are so many terrific performances out there of these basic repertoire staples that it's absolutely absurd to say, well, there's only just one that has to be the best. The only one that has to be the best is the one I tell you is the best at the time I tell you. Any other time, it may be a different one. That's the way it works with this stuff, right? So let's just get right to it because this doesn't have to be a very long talk, but it's going to be very pointed and precise. Piano concerto number one, by Rachmaninoff, one of the two, the other being number four, that nobody particularly likes and nobody particularly cares about. I think it's a lovely work. It's young, it's fresh, it's exciting. It has good tunes, wonderful piano writing. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. The only thing that's wrong with it is that it's not the second or third piano concerto. So it tends to get short shrift. And that's why my recommendation in the first piano concerto is Byron Janus with Kirill Kondrashin, recorded in Moscow on Mercury Living Presence. Now, why do I choose this one? You know, Byron Janus is one of the very, very few pianists who recorded the first piano concerto more than once. He had done it previously with Fritz Reiner. And that really means something. That's important because, because he had the music in his fingers. He really knew it. And he loved it, and he cared about it, and he takes it seriously. Kondrashin, of course, is a fabulous conductor, and it's great to have him on anything. And I think between the two of them, you have an absolutely outstanding performance of the first piano concerto. Of course, you could always get the Fritz Reiner recording, too. I mean, what's not to love, right? I mean, they're 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 terrific. They're they're all terrific. But I think that I think that that on the whole. I prefer this one just for the, the sonics and, you know, the, the bite that both performers bring to the work. And I think it's stunning. And if you don't know the first concerto and don't like the first concerto or think you may not like the first concerto, this performance will make you love it, guaranteed. All right, piano concerto number two. Oh, what a toughie. I mean, everyone and their mother has done the second piano concerto, right? A million, billion, trillion times. There's so many performances out there. And I've picked a classic because, um, well, I'll tell you why. It's Rubinstein and Reiner on RCA. The reason I picked this is, first of all, Rubinstein did not make a complete Rachmaninoff cycle. In fact, he only did the second concerto in the Paganini Rhapsody in the works for piano and orchestra. So that makes his Rachmaninoff concerto recordings special, number one. And number two, the reason I really like it is because, you know, Rubinstein didn't have a vulgar bone in his body, especially in his later years. You know, in his later years were most of his stereo years. You know, he... he played everything with a certain magisterial quality. It has nothing to do with slowness or pomposity or pretentiousness, but just just a, a calmness and a beauty that I think works really well with this concerto. Because one of the things you may notice about the second concerto right away is that you know the piano accompanies the orchestra, not the other way around. It's a very symphonic piece. There's a tremendous integration between piano and orchestra, both here and in the third, maybe even more so in the third. So, so when I get a performance of the second, much as I enjoy barn-burning virtuosi, I want to hear a performance that has something of a sense of cooperation with the orchestra, however dazzling and virtuosic it may be. And again, 
that treats the music with a certain level of dignity, which I think I think it deserves because I think it has that. But I also think that that Rachmaninoff is very often treated like it's you know just sort of trashy showman's music, and and it's really not. He was really a composer first in some ways rather than a pianist, although he was, of course, an unbelievable pianist. And his piano music generally requires a certain probing quality to the interpretations. It's, it's musician's music. I mean, it, it has those sort of higher values, and too often it's just played for kicks. And, and, and Rubinstein really understood that. He really understood how to give the music the class that it should have. And so that's why I love Rubenstein and Reiner. Also has a great Paganini Rhapsody, which I think may have been my choice in that talk. I have to go back and look. So many good ones. What do you do? Okay, now the third concerto. For the third concerto, I've made a selection that's probably one that you might expect, but it's it's the Martha Argerich with Ricardo Chailly, the old Phillips recording that's now on Decca. And the reason I picked Argerich is because she is just the opposite of Rubinstein. And that's what makes it so interesting. It shows you the range of possibilities in interpreting the music. And that's that's what these these ideal things are all about. It's not just it's not just picking the one way, but showing the many ways that different artists can approach the music of the same composer. And the third concerto, which is just as symphonic as the second, really you would think is not exactly the kind of work that suits the barn-burning virtuoso in who's going to show off like a barn-burning virtuoso. Argerich is a force of nature, as we all know. She plays the living daylights out of the piece. The orchestra in this particular performance, because it's live, you know, is somewhat in the background. Um, it's not as well integrated as some of the other ones. I could have chosen one of the Byron Janus recordings very, very easily. He did the third concerto at least twice, and they're both superb. There are There's Kautschus, there's the new Stephen Huff. There are lots of really good Rachmaninoff third concertos out there. But I just liked Argerich because whereas Rubinstein is is calm and poised in everything he does, even in the most virtuoso and exciting business you know, parts, Argerich is just the opposite. She is improvisatory and willful, but but here's what they have in common. You know, you know, whereas in Rubinstein, you know, the excitement arises out of his his command of the music and his that that Olympian sort of uh, you know aura that he projects. With Argerich, she's never she never loses control. I mean, sometimes she hits a wrong note, but she never loses control. She always knows what she's doing. She's always on top of the music, no matter how free-ranging she gets. And this performance, I mean, it's about as exciting as it's possible to be in this concerto. And it's really, it's really amazing. It's particularly effective in that long, long slow movement, which can seem completely shapeless unless you, unless you impose some sort of some sort of structure on it. And she does that. She does it with Shai. It's really quite wonderful. So I, I choose Argerich for the third concerto and um, leaving open the possibility, of course, that there are many other alternative versions. Now, for the fourth. For the fourth, there are very few single versions of the fourth that you know are, are not part of cycles. Most of the best ones are part of cycles. But of course, there's one, and you know which one it is. I'm just pulling it out here. It is Michelangeli. You have to have Michelangeli, right? You don't have any choice. You must have Michelangeli. Why? Because it's simply the most amazing piano playing you'll ever hear in your life in this particular work. And because the piece itself is very different from Rachmaninoff's other music. You know, he has this reputation for being such a hard-on-sleeve romantic. But the fourth, the fourth is a cool work. It's, it's emotionally somewhat cool. It's crisp. It's sharp. His late music, the symphonic dances do this too. And to some extent, bits of the Third Symphony. You know, he, he began to evolve a very personal, almost, I wouldn't call it neoclassical because it's not in any way, but but anti anti sentimental 
um, approach to his music. And the fourth concerto is perhaps the biggest embodiment of that, which is why it's not so popular. It needs to be played the way Michelangelo plays it. Some people find his playing glacial, and it is because of its perfection. It's almost like Heifetz on the violin. You know, when you're when you're that crisp and that on top of it and that effortless in terms of your virtuosity, people sometimes come away thinking that the music is not being treated as emotionally as it should or as expressively as it should be treated. But the fourth concerto benefits from that. That's the kind of music it is. And so Michelangelo's performance is unquestionably the one to own. And there are others, but again, I'm not even going to talk about them. You've got to start with Michelangelo. Now we come to the Paganini Rhapsody. The Paganini Rhapsody has probably more good performances than any other work for piano and orchestra written in the Romantic period. It's it's such it's just such a great piece. It's really Rachmaninoff's greatest work for piano and orchestra because it perfectly perfectly balances intellectual content with emotional expression. There is no more gorgeous tune than that 18th variation, but it's simply an inversion of the theme. It's the, it's that combination of of strictness that never gets in the way of of immediacy of of an intensity of emotional expression that makes the work so great and so much fun to listen to. Oh my God, is there anything more fun? I've played it a couple times in the orchestra too. It's just a blast to do. And frankly, at about 25 minutes long, it is concerto length. I mean, it is a concerto. I mean, it does everything that a concerto is supposed to do. It shows off the soloist, it shows off the orchestra, they cooperate and interact with each other, and it has a wonderful trajectory, and the end is funny. And Rachmaninoff was not known for his sense of humor. No, no, no. You know, Stravinsky referred to him as, what, the six and a half foot scowl or something like that. You know, he never smiled. But the end is humorous. He was always enriching his musical language, which shows you that as a composer capable of growth, we would do well not to underestimate the quality of what he did and and the the depths that are there to be plumbed by soloists and orchestral musicians who feel like plumbing. They have to be plumbers. You know what I mean? So the best Paganini Rhapsody is Earl Wilde. Ooh, it's all glary. Earl Wilde and Yasha Hornstein, which was available on Reader's Digest or Chesky or Chandos. First of all, it's one of the few good recordings by Yasha Hornstein. The reason, of course, is because he's an accompanist and he's got Earl Wilde and he's an excellent accompanist in this case. And Earl Wilde plays the living daylights out of the music. Oh, it's so great. It's so exciting. And it's marvelously well recorded. Holy cow, it sounds just fabulous. So if you want an absolutely great Paganini Rhapsody, and again, there are many, many, many. There was Rubinstein. There's the Stephen Huff. There's Cochis. There's Leonard Panario. There's there's a large, large number of first-rate Paganini Rhapsodies. But this must be primus inter pares, as they say in Yiddish. First among equals, if not first all around. Earl Wild. Earl Wild. He was such a great pianist, too. I mean, his whole Rachmaninoff cycle was fantastic. And that, my friends, in a nutshell, is the easy way to find your way through the four Rachmaninoff piano concertos and the Paganini Rhapsody. Now, I am sure you have your own selections. Please feel free to let me know what they are. Do not repeat any of mine. Come up with your own because there are so many performances of some of this stuff, although the first and the fourth may be a little tricky. I actually think this is going to be fun, because even though there are not that many works, there's such a huge disparity in popularity between two and three and one and four. And then, of course, the Paganini Rhapsody goes with two and three. It's just as popular. It actually could be something of a challenge to come up with a fresh list. And I'm very curious to see what you do and which ones you like. So keep on listening, folks. Rachmaninoff is great stuff. Don't take him for granted. Take care. All the best.